Good afternoon and welcome to the Federal Executive Forum celebrating 17 years of profiling excellence in government IT mission programs. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss best practices with IT modernization programs and strategies in the federal government. With me on today's show are Gardy Rosias, Acting Deputy Chief Information Officer, Architecture, Engineering, Technology and Innovation, Department of Energy. Melanie Cannon, Director of Systems Integration Office, Department of State. Nicole Willis, Chief Technology Officer, Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General. Rob Carey, President, Cloudera, Government Solutions Incorporated. Nick Nylon, Director, Federal Civilian Verizon. And Scott Crowder, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer at BMC Software. Well, we're talking about IT modernization. I know that uh, Department of Energy was very instrumental in this recent playbook that came out. Gardy, what's happening at Department of Energy? Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation, um, and uh, thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, well, at the Department of Energy, we've been, uh, we've been very busy. Um, you know, as you know, uh, those of us who are technologists and in the federal space, uh, we have to balance the interwoven priorities uh, between uh, delivering uh, reliable IT services. Uh, cybersecurity is a big one. I'm sure Nicole will be talking about that, uh, as well as, you know, driving digital innovation and, and the digital transformation. So um, we've been seeing a, a couple of good things uh, from my perspective, uh, from all the way from the top, if you're looking at what Congress has been doing over the past couple of years, uh, just you know, putting out legislations and 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 sort of staying engaged with the process because I think they realize you know that we have to do that, <laughs> and uh, and where they're falling short, I think uh, you could see uh, the leadership uh, at, the, at the top of the agencies are really stepping up. I can speak for for our organization. We, as you said, we put out the IT uh, scaling IT modernization playbook. Uh, you know, out of a recognition that you know we we have to do a little bit a little bit uh, more uh, to help us to kind of get get through all the modernization efforts that are going on, and we're trying to lean more on the agile development, uh, you know, agile uh, mindset, if you will, because uh, one thing that I keep pushing is we we have to start recognizing uh, incremental progress as real progress. Oftentimes we're like, well, you know, if we can only do this a little bit, it's not you know, let's not, let's focus on something else that we can tackle. And I think it's a great way of sort of uh, transition in that area. And uh, and also just kind of be mindful of some of these processes, such as DevSecOps, that, that will help us to, to do some of these things. Just, uh, just to mention uh, two quick examples real quick. Some of you may be familiar with the Data Center Optimization Initiative. Where uh, DOE is uh, is a leader in in the in, in the implementation of that initiative, uh, we we've closed some fifty six data centers and and uh, deploying tools on top of the remaining data centers so that we can make sure that we're we have modern data centers for for the data centers that we are we're still maintaining. Uh, we're looking at data and AI. Uh, we we have a. Uh, a little project that we started, again, talking about incremental progress uh, being real progress. We just started, we wanted to address a small little problem and we it was so successful. Now we started branching out, sort of looking at different ways that we can apply, you know, these emer- some of these emerging technologies to help uh, the department. And we're talking to our colleagues across the department to see how we can help them also and kind of share lessons learned and share technical practices and so on and so forth. So again, we, We've been very busy, and um, so that's all I'll, I'll say for now. And uh, uh, looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Gardy, thank you very much, and again, nice work on that playbook. Um, uh, I think that's gonna you know, get a lot of a uh, lot of traction, a lot of mileage, and good timing on that. Melanie, I know there is a tremendous amount of activity, modernization activity going on at state across state and in a lot of different areas. Give us a uh, top line state of the state at state, so to speak. State of the state at state, um, just like my colleague over in DOE, we um, have been very, very busy also in um, various realms, but listening to him um, just speak, some of the same areas, he he talked about decoy, the data center optimization, and we know that, that data center and cloud uh, optimization initiative, and we know that um, that is sunsetting and um, I, um, I won't say that I'm happy to see that go, but I, I, am, I would be happy to see what, what comes next after that because there were challenges um, in that area. 
uh, for for agencies, depending on the size and the scope of the work and things of that nature. So um, we ha we were not as uh, successful with uh, I would say closing 23 data centers, but we, you know, we put our stake in the ground and uh, we made great uh, strides in that area as well. So I'm happy to hear my colleagues speak on that this morning. Um, other things that have been happening here in state, most recently, um, we've been doing a um, huge push towards the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Things that can go in the cloud and, you know, some everything that can go in the cloud should go in the cloud. Everything should go in the cloud, but can't go in the cloud. So you have those conversations um, in the corridor. Some of us are still in the office. Some of us never went home um, due to COVID. We're still here. So we have those conversations about the cloud. Um, one of the most recent success for us is that um, we recently stood up um, a classified environment, a cloud um, classified environment. So that's uh, one of the one of the many modernized efforts that we've done here at state. There's been a huge push uh, towards um, before cloud, um, COVID. We were moving towards um, expanding Wi-Fi throughout our federal facilities. Uh, very important because what do we do? Everyone is walking around with mobile devices and things of that nature, right? But if there's no connectivity, how are you operating? Um, so that was our Wi-Fi um, extantiation was another huge push for the Department of State. Um, and on the data center realm, uh, rolling back to that, we also um, transitioned um, our hosting platform to a hyper-converged um, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So that was a great thing. It also went towards um, some credits with the uh, DC COI, the data center cloud data center cloud and optimization initiative. It also gave us credit in that platform as well. So um, there's just a lot of things going on. We're trying to align not only to what uh, we are called to do by our mission, but also uh, what our partners here at the Department of State are, are seeking um, from a better, I would say more modernized. And I wanna say this, I told someone yesterday, we're modernizing people as well. <laughs> We, we are changing the face of how things work um, with individuals, people such as myself that has 30 plus years of federal service mm -hmm. um, and the, those that are just coming in the door maybe five or less years ago. Our mindsets have to modernize so that we can properly use the technologies um, that are being put out there. So we're modernizing people as well, not just the technology with the people. I love that uh, modernizing people, and I know you all are on a uh, quite a journey there with your multi-cloud strategy, et cetera. A, a lot of uh, uh, moving parts there that you're trying to snap together as you put that framework out there and uh, enable those diplomats. Nicole, uh, I know there's a lot of activity going on over at HHS, specifically in your area. Can you give us a top line as to what you have cooking over there at the IG. Sure. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me on this panel. And it's so great at, to see you, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Um, at OIG, over the past few years, we, like others have mentioned, we've been migrating a lot of our older legacy applications to our cloud platforms. Um, we've also been partnered closely with our chief data officers office, really building out um, new data and analytical applications on our cloud and software as a service platforms. Um, we're our shift now, you know, we've been moving and migrating and have a lot of traction for our cloud platform, but now is the time that we're looking at optimizing it, really moving from having multiple clouds to having a real multi-cloud ecosystem. So that we have an ecosystem that will enable us to make decisions um, based on the best value to OIG, um, based on technical fit um, and, and cost. Um, we are also um, implementing foundational projects around um, zero trust. Um, we have several projects that we are currently working around around identity management, implementing a secure access service edge, um, maturing our security operations, um, automated, automated data mapping, and really improving our visibility and analytics across our assets to proactively um, manage and mitigate risk. And we are also, also um, working on building out AI automation and orchestration applications for some of our um, business IT and zero trust solutions. A lot of uh, interesting activity going on there, obviously zero trust being front and center. Uh, Rob, Nicole mentioned um, chief data officers and uh, I wanted you to, to give us a top line to state, you know, a lot of these agencies now have chief data officers and Perhaps maybe you could share what your advice would be in developing a successful IT modernization roadmap. 
Yeah, uh, Luke, thanks. So uh, it's interesting um, that they're popping up everywhere, which is good. Lots of chiefs. Yeah, yeah. And people have that coming in, reporting in different areas of the uh, And, and so, uh, you know, my advice uh, right out of the shoot would be to align with the CIO and the CISO because the data is this pervasive. The chief data officer is responsible for managing this uh, level of information that is used for decision making, right? Or or system ingest, system you know processing, things like that. Um, and so, in order to be successful, there is, in my mind, an overlap between the CISO and the CIO's responsibilities to make sure successful missions are delivered, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that alignment is absolutely crucial. I heard uh, both Nicole and, and Gardy talk about AI and Melanie talked about AI. And, and remember, AI is a tool that is very, very useful once models are developed that are repeatable and the information is able to be consumed and then pushed out the other side. And remember, you know, leadership is interested in two things from the IT community. They are interested in you're either saving them money or you're moving the mission downfield, right? That they're the only two levers that anybody really cares about. So AI becomes that fundamental that pushes decision agility, right? So helping leaders make decisions. And so the 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 uh, CDO seems to be the guy that sort of owns the technologies that move that forward. So so again, you have to play a role as, as a CDO to enable the, the mission of the organization to move forward. Um, and at times, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I want to control something, well, the CIO controls that. Again, this alignment amongst the leadership team and the IT community has to be essential. Otherwise, once you're out of sync, you're not supporting the mission, right? So that'd be my, my uh, two cents on advising. Really appreciate that, Rob. Good, good insights. Nick, um, you know, we, 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 we look back at Verizon as uh, absolutely part of the critical infrastructure. It's certainly not our parents' telecommunications uh, entity anymore. You all are right smack in the fabric of transforming these various agencies. Give us a, a top line of what are you seeing there? What, what, what activity, what, what are these agencies now sort of got you in the middle of these days? Yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and good afternoon, Luke. Um, I, I think where Verizon finds itself now as we have conversations around uh, the data center optimization initiative, uh, around zero trust, around data in general and where it's stored and how it's accessed, the thing that connects all this, the thing that allows all of this to happen uh, is a network. And, and we can't rely on the networks that we had uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we need to think differently about the networks we build. And I think the interesting conversations we're having are ones where we're early into this conversation of, as I move from on-prem data centers or storage to the cloud or to multiple clouds or to, I love the 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 conversation on from multiple clouds to a multi-cloud system. That was, mm -hmm. a, that was a great quote. Um, when we think about where data is stored, we have to think about the network that allows us to access that, da that data reliably uh, and dynamically. Uh, and so that's where Verizon really fits in, is, is in the conversation of how do you get the data to the right person or the right uh, device at the right time uh, to be able to make that decision, to be able to push that decision making downstream. Uh, and and that's, that's really the conversations we're having with customers now. And that's over multiple types of networks. That's over fiber, that's over wireless, over 5G, but it's all managed dynamically through software-defined networking and network function virtualization. Uh, and we're constantly shifting uh, the strategies for agencies as they think about where that data now sits and how it's secured. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's a... Uh, uh... Every agency has sort of this multi-segment, multi-channel type of modernization activity going on, and um, uh, very important to have these various different aspects. Scott, uh, speaking about being in the fabric of these agencies to help them transform and modern modernize, tell us what you're seeing uh, stay the state, if you will, at BMC. Well, we've got a lot of things going on, Luke. Um, you know, really, we've had a SaaS first strategy for quite a few years now, and uh, we're probably about 85 to 87% SaaS and public cloud. Um, so that's, you know, one of the ways that we modernize, but the other mm -hmm. thing is just automation, automation everywhere. So, 
you know, we, we really are striving to make automation self-service and really push that out to the various lines of business to get done what they need to do. Um, back to Melanie. I mean, Melanie, I'm with you on Zero Trust. Uh, we implemented that a couple of years ago, and uh, it's absolutely critical. Uh, the security uh, posture of our enterprises and our, and our public agencies is uh, paramount, and um, it's, it's a top priority for us. And, um, you know, quite frankly, I mean, there's just there's a ton of things going on when, you know, Nick was talking. Uh, he talked a little bit about getting that data back for meaningful insights and really understanding what's happening within the fabric and infrastructure. But when you start thinking about all the things associated with IoT and, you know, really, you know, trying to pre-process and then aggregate and then send what's meaningful into the network, uh, that's really the only way that you can actually uh, get these insights without having just gobs of data in your data centers. Um, so, you know, these are just a few of the things that we're working on. You know, we have, you know, products now like Hedge, well, Helix Edge, uh, that really does a lot with IoT, but also, you know, our uh, monitoring platforms are highly scaled. And uh, our BMC Helix Operations Manager is uh, something that is part of that entire fabric that pulls everything together key piece of technology to unlock yep. some of this capability. Well, speaking yep. of unlocking, uh, Melanie, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give us a, maybe highlight a specific program. You top-lined a lot of different activity that's going on over there at State. Perhaps you can uh, you can uh, shine the light on one of them that's sort of unlocking some of this capability that we talk about as you modernize. Certainly, Luke. Um <laughs> I'll just roll back to our ClassNet uh, cloud initiative that uh, we undertook some time ago. Um, the scenario went like this. Melanie, I need you and your team to develop a proof of concept. <laughs> okay. And have, have it done by Monday. <laughs> I need to do it by Monday, and I don't have any money for you. You're going to have to use the resources you have. I have nothing else extra to give you. Okay, we can do that. All right, but understand, I can't go beyond the proof of concept because I need resources. Mm -hmm. the, the next conversation was, thank you, great proof of concept. Now I need you to get to working. So <laughs> what do we do? Um, we, we do what we do best. We, we perform and, and we deliver. And um, I, I am blessed to have a, a great team of um, not just technical brains, but um, just people good people that work together um, under sometimes stressful situations. Um, the effort was uh, monumentous for us, <clears throat> excuse me, here on the state side. Um, our team was able to take, and I wanna say probably within less than, I'm gonna say two years and understanding the fabric of state department, you would have, you would understand why I say that this was such a, a, a huge um, undertaking and also uh, such a success. Um, and it was probably about 14 to 18 months where we went from post proof, proof of concept and understand this was cloud. This was classified cloud. This wasn't just something that, you know, you go and you click a box with one of our vendors and things of that nature. We mm -hmm. worked with our partners, um, our Gov cloud partners. We worked with, we had to work with DISA. There are some other things that went, you know, that were involved um, here. And because it's cloud, I'll just keep it high level here. But we were able to um, successfully deploy with ATO in approximately 14 to 18 months. And um, what it showed was, you know, the resiliency of the team. Uh, we already talked about Agile and how that works in the fabric of doing things, how we're going to save the government money and how we're going to move towards the goal of completing a mission. So um, I, I would say that one of the most recent and, and I, I bring this one up one, because it's in my wheelhouse, but two, we just recently did this a few months ago. So um, I, I think I, I would land it there. And sure. getting that ATO within that time period, um, it was remarkable um, to say the least. So Right, and a super important capability that uh, enables a lot of these other things to happen. So we really do appreciate that. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We are talking about IT modernization. We were highlighting a specific example, if you will. And Nick, I'm gonna roll over to you and ask you to give us a specific example 
of something you'd like to top line that uh, something you've been doing at perhaps one of these agencies? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I think the a lot of the focus that we've had so far in the conversation is around uh, data center optimization, data, where it's stored. Uh, where I'd like to highlight is actually some of the use of that data. Um, and last December, the uh, we saw the executive order come out around customer experience and citizen experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's driven a lot of our agencies to think differently about uh, their mission and, and who they support and the citizens that they serve. Uh, and that's allowed them to look at their data in a different way, the data that they have to serve the citizens uh, of this great nation. And, and that has uh, really shown a light on the technology that they have at their disposal to be able to interact and open a dialogue between the citizens that they serve. And so what we've seen over the last really 10 months uh, is an evaluation of the technology that they have, but also the way that they're operationally structured. And so we've seen uh, agencies really look at web UX design again from a new, new perspective, uh, as well as contact center technologies. So call centers, both internal call centers, external call centers, uh, and how citizens are able to leverage those services. We saw that in the States, uh, certainly during the pandemic about accessing uh, unemployment resources and others, but we see it at the federal level too. Uh, agencies that run massive contact centers like the IRS and Postal Service uh, that are looking at new technologies uh, like natural language processing within their IVR to help reduce costs, but also to deliver a better experience for people calling into those agencies. And so I think what we've seen over the last 10 months is just a, a, a great focus on uh, the operational structures that will enable a good customer experience, but also those foundational technologies uh, that can be uh, deployed at scale for some of the largest agencies. That agencies yeah, no, no question that uh, that that CX experience, if you will, uh, extremely important and certainly uh, front and center these days. Gardy, I'm going to roll it over to you. I know there's just some tremendous sophistication going on over there at Department of Energy. And uh, you're, uh, you're faced with sort of dealing with all those various um, uh, entities in, in, in regards to the labs, et cetera. Give us an example uh, of the, a program that you'd like to highlight that sort of maybe unlock some of that capability there. Thank you. Um, I think I'll cheat a little bit, just a little bit, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about That's okay. <laughs> I'll talk about two, but primarily, I just want to kind of touch on the IT modernization playbook. Uh, I think uh, most of your viewers, or at least uh, I, ex I expect that they've they've heard or seen it. But if you haven't, I, I strongly encourage that you go to energy.gov slash CIO and, and take a look at our uh, I scaling IT modernization playbook. Uh, if you're not familiar with the IT uh, scaling IT modernization playbook, it's a it's a it's a it's a resource that offer that offers you a set of plays uh, that you could use, a concrete roadmap that you could use to help you sort of uh uh implement uh, a change at scale and uh whereby you can quickly get to to very transformative value and help to advance your mission forward uh one of the good things that we we saw from the playbook um what we kind of expected but it was it was still it was uh, somewhat surprising was the reaction that we were getting from from the commercial sector uh, we the the intent was let's let's create a playbook that um mm -hmm. Can help our federal colleagues with you know with with uh, uh, scaling IT modernization, and then when we put it out, we got uh, reactions such as "Wow, uh, you, you're you're looking at the exact problems that we've been dealing with, and you're providing uh, actions that we think are very uh, relatable uh, to us in terms of how we need to to deal with some of these things." So it's not just for 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 federal uh, leaders, but it's also for for anyone that might be interested, that 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 anyone who's still dealing with sort of uh, transform transformation, digital transformation in their space, uh, one of the uh, one of the effort where we we uh, we've applied some of these techniques is uh, I think uh, Nicole and Melanie talked about uh, the the value of prototyping proof of concept. Right, uh, we started <laughs> with a small proof of concept mm -hmm. around uh, a conversational chat chatbot and. Uh, and it was just, hey, let's see, you know, what's there. We had a platform. It had some capability on it. it was, let's evaluate it. And in the process, we we realized that, well, it makes no sense that we're sort of evaluating this without having a, a real problem to address. So we reached out to one of our um, uh, 
business colleagues and we said, hey, can, would you would you like to to uh, to work with us? And they came back, yes, we you know we'd be more than happy to work with you. That's that's our small uh, business office, and it's been a great partnership ever since. And we we've managed to build you know one of the one of the best uh, conversational agent in that space. And what we realized was that a lot of our uh, colleagues across uh, the federal space uh, did not have that capability and they needed it because, as you know, small businesses, they don't have a huge budget, right? But they still have to use, serve a, a, a significant number of customers. Mm-hmm. So, so on top of that, we've been building some additional capabilities, but again, just sort of uh, realizing the value of incremental change, incremental sort of uh, uh, deliverables. And we, we just keep building on top of it. And we, we're looking to see how we can expand it. Again, I think I said that in my opening remarks, um, we're working with our, with our partners across the federal space to see how then we share and then how, what can we learn in the process of sharing with them. Yeah, proof of concepts is very important. The town is running on proof of concepts for all the right reasons. Yeah. Rob, I'm going to throw it over to you. Uh, several of the uh, folks have talked about data. Nick mentioned it as well. And, uh, you know, there's sort of that uh, we all are familiar with the last mile. Let's talk about the first mile on that data journey and uh, perhaps what the agency should be considering as they move forward, becoming sort of this data centric uh, entity, if you will. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a good point, um, Luke, to be able to sort of stare at this, you know, sea of information mm-hmm. that exists Which is ever increasing and i heard multiple uh folks here on the call talking about uh uh moving from multiple clouds to a hybrid cloud uh, ecosystem or a multi-cloud ecosystem so sort of knitting that together into you know a, a data fabric uh but but understanding where your data is very important and then being able to uh once it's located you know that first mile of find it and move it, like no matter where it is, you don't want to care about where it is or care what format it's in. You want to be able to get it to that central place. So that that first mile is sort of crucial to be able to uh, take the next steps of information management. You know, we are we do some things for some customers that uh, moving edge data, let's just say log data from all the edge devices into mm-hmm. a central location. Uh, in support of cybersecurity. Okay, so putting a big data platform to you know collect it, streamline it, align it, r- enrich it, uh, and put it in a format that it can be consumed by the cybersecurity stack before the cybersecurity stack performs its functions, actually aids in detection times. It aids in uh, detection rates. You know, so it moves detection times down, uh, detection rates up. And then obviously you're putting data into the cybersecurity stack that is already pre-processed, if you will. That first mile, you can use, you know, open source tools like NiFi and Kafka and Flink to perform some enrichment and some uh, level of processing that when it gets to the cybersecurity stack, it makes the job of the stack a whole lot more effective than it would be prior to that. And so a lot of bang, uh, for a little bit of bucks that actually gets you to a place where as you're the CISO now and you're you're now operating a very finely tuned machine compared to what you were uh, prior to having this, this processing being done. But importantly is any source to any location. You don't want to care about that. If you're the CIO or you're the CDO, you don't want to worry about where is it? Or you, you want to know where it is, but you don't want to, you're not worried about why it is where it is. It could be in the cloud already. It may not be in the cloud already. It may be in a, a, a legacy data center and you want to put it in the cloud. So the destination and the and the origination shouldn't be of consequence. You'll be able to identify it and move it and then to do the things that you want to do with it with that modern ecosystem that I heard the two ladies talking about. So sure. um, that first mile sort of crucial to get it where you want to have it to use it. And to be really super efficient about how you're managing and processing that data, all part of this modernization journey. Nicole, how about over at the uh, the OIG, you want to give us an example of a program that you'd like to highlight? Sure. So I've said I talked about I'm gonna talk about a mission example because we've been doing a lot of modernization of our older Love applications. The mission examples. <laughs> so um, you know, at OIG, our mission is around promoting the economy, effectiveness, um, efficiency, and integrity of HHS programs, as well as mm-hmm. the health 
and welfare of the people that we serve. So one of the projects we took on, we partnered with our audit and evaluation office um, as they provide, you know, they conduct audits and evaluations to help improve the program. So one of the things they do for that is issue recommendations. Um, previously, we they were doing this through um, siloed applications um, and email <laughs> um, to all of the um, uh, the optives at HHS, like FD, FDA and um, um CMS. So we worked with our partners, our business partners, and built a new application on our um, kind of low code platform. Um, this really has been a, a game changer for this. We really were able to unify the data and the processes across um, the OIG organizations, and now they are able to kind of interact with um, the other HHS optives to help kind of get those recommendations um, out to the um, optives and resolved and have that interchange in a in one place in one central location versus um, you know, and it's giving kind of OIG that one voice um, and allowing us to better streamline kind of the the interaction around um, our audits and evaluations. And as you highlight these various operating components and you think about that, it's just, you know, uh, HHS is massive. And so OIG having to sort of normalize that and be able to uh, become um, effective and efficient there is, uh, is fantastic. I'm sure that's really uh, unlocking a lot of efficiency at uh, at HHS. So thank you very much for that. Scott, how about over at uh, BMC? Give us a, an example of a program you'd like to highlight. You all see a lot of different things and a lot of different various activities across these agencies. Give us a uh, specific program you'd like to touch on. Yeah, absolutely, Luke. So it, it's really amazing how in alignment we all are. So um, I've heard a lot about data insights during this discussion, during this mm -hmm. segment. And um, actually, uh, Rob, you would appreciate this. Uh, we created what we call within our information security office, uh, a cybersecurity data hub. And actually, we were fortunate enough to win the CIO 100 uh, award on that specific uh, category. But, you know, when you're talking about billions of logs and billions of events that you're having to process, uh, there's not a SIM out there or any of the other traditional tools that can actually pull all of that together and just for uh, full disclosure, we do not sell this product. This is something we did inside as a proof of concept and actually uh, carried it forward. And uh, now it's an integral part of how we analyze all of the logs as well as uh, just, you know, quick, quick stat. We went from uh, analyzing, you know, really doing the forensics uh, within our information security office and, and as well as the SOC. Um, we actually reduced that time by 90% really using what we call real-time event enrichment. And you know, when you when you think about the gobbledygook that comes in from all of these different systems and how do you correlate that network port to that SAN port to this, you know, it, it, it not, nowhere does it all come together. Uh, but really that system allowed us to do that. And um, actually we took a we took that real-time enrichment, you know, event enrichment uh, process, we're integrating that into our monitoring platform. We just pulled a piece out of what we did as a proof of concept and then put it into our actual product. So that was something I'm super excited about, Luke. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's just tons of things around automation. Um, you know, we're actually, I'm running in my DR mode right now. We we flip over to DR uh, once a year for a week. Mm, okay. And, um, you know, we operate the business, you know, quite frankly, the business doesn't even know this is happening quite, <laughs> because it's pretty seamless. And, you know, we've automated much of that process. So using some of our tools, mm -hmm. um, literally reduced it by 85, 90%. You know, if you think about failing over Oracle, for example, that's a laborious process. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. if I can push one button and have it automatically change the, you know, switch ports, all of the different, you know, move the data over, do all the things that it needs to do from an orchestration layer and, you know, really, you know, prove out the technology and ensure mm -hmm. that you're survivable, right? Uh, that's something I'm also just super excited about. A great, great example there in DR. Um, I used to say that DR testing uh, was always an event, uh, oftentimes a catastrophic event. <laughs> I think many of you can uh, can appreciate that uh, going through some of that testing. All right, we're going to talk about priorities. Melanie, I'm going to start with you. Top two priorities. I know you have a lot of stuff you're doing there. Give us the top two priorities. Top two. Okay. Um, let's talk about future work, right? All right. uh, again, going into COVID, it, it made, you know, all 
everyone pivot into something different. And we were able to successfully do that. But now um, with the hurry up and rush, how do we modernize and how do we continue to build upon those platforms that may have mm -hmm. been put in place or modernized or enhanced? So um, that's one of, um, I would say, one of the top priorities, future work. What does that look like? And how does IT support that? How does IT support the customer? How does it support our partners, our missions, things of that nature? And um, I'll just do a sub to that. Uh, here in the Information Resource Management Bureau where I work, uh, we've uh, kicked off a pr uh, project or a task called uh, Tech for Life, meaning that um, mm -hmm. When you come in, and you know, most people know that we have worldwide missions here at the Department of State. Uh, we have, you know, our post abroad and our staff that support us um, at the various emb embassies and consulates, and then we have our domestic staff. Uh, one of the challenges that we ran into is during COVID, uh, we we had to figure out a way, how do we get um, a laptop to that new employee that was just hired? Or how does the employee that's transitioning from one post to another um, stay mobile as far as connected to the workplace uh, where people, the offices are closed due to COVID and things of that nature. So our Tech for Life um, project is, is something else. We've, um, I think the goal is to deploy over 9,000 laptops. When Wherever you go, you don't have to leave your laptop or leave your phone at that post. Mm -hmm. You're taking it with you. We're tracking it, we're issuing it to you. We're making sure that you have all the, the latest updates and patches and things of that nature. Um, this conversation today has gone around. Um, we all know that security, it circles everything that we do, Every everything that we, um, plan uh, has to have that security element to it, right? And how do you make sure that your um, security is not compromised uh, when you have people, so much movement uh, occurring? One other thing, I know you said two, so I gave you one and a half, but the second one I wanted to say that mm -hmm. uh, we all in the industry know, I'm sure that uh, Department of State, we are waiting for our new CIO to come in. And mm -hmm. uh, we're just preparing because a new CIO, uh, CIO comes in, they will come in with their um, ideas and um, after evaluation, I'm sure, and things of that nature of where we're at. And there may be some more uh, new tasks placed on uh, upon us. But again, as I talked about the classified uh, cloud, we are um, agile enough to pivot and uh, accomplish what needs to be done. No doubt when you get a leader in, you'll have some, uh, you know, a lot of the direction will stay the same as, you know, it should at the State Department, and then there'll be some fresh ideas. So I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on the Federal News Network. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We are talking about IT modernization. And we're talking about priorities. Guardian, I'm going to start with you. Uh, give us your top two priorities over there at the Department of Energy. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I would start by saying uh, our, the work that we're doing with the ZTA, um, uh, Executive Order 14082, um, I think is... is uh, Job it's, one. Yeah, job one for everyone. So maybe that doesn't count. But uh, one area where we really are focusing is uh, how do we fast track our data adoption, data transformation uh, within the department? Um, for, for a while, we didn't have, uh, uh, we, we weren't making as much progress that, that we, we, could have, we could have been making with, mm -hmm. with regards to the sort of data transformation. So we, we I think uh, our chief data officer is, is, is is uh, working on this issue and, and uh, seeing how, you know, we can collaborate between the offices and making sure that uh, over the next uh, uh, couple of years that we make some real progress because there's a ton of data, as you could imagine, within the department. And that's one. The, the other one, I think, is really aligning our our, uh, our innovation strategy with, with really the enterprise strategy. What I mean by that is, you know, uh, we have a roadmap for for what we think should happen from an IT perspective. And we have this sort of innovation arm that we're using to sort of help to guide that in terms of execution. So, so we really are focusing on, you know, how, uh, what we're doing, uh, making sure that how, what we're doing is, is consistent and is supporting the, the, uh, the overall enterprise strategy. For example, we know that uh, the, the low code 
space is is a tremendous sort of opportunity present a tremendous mm-hmm. opportunity right with a ton of data low entry to low barrier to entry all of these things are 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 you know making this space really attractive so one of the efforts that we're working on that we we've been working on for, you know since the beginning of the year is build uh standing up uh, what we're calling a local platform factory uh, this is where we we're creating a strategy around how we engage with these platforms and and how we make sure that we're providing efficient, timely, and secure service to our to our customers. And there's a ton of data in this. You 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 wouldn't. I'm, I'm sure everyone can can imagine how much data is there. Um, there is uh, there's a lot of data transformation that needs to happen before we can sort of present the information, present the data. So these are these are some of the things that we're looking at uh, over the next year, and uh, hopefully. Uh, we'll be able to make uh, some significant progress there. Sounds like some fantastic things to be focusing on. Nicole, top two priorities for you over at the OIG. Okay, so zero. I'm going to say zero trust. Um, Got to so say we, it, right? I have to. Um, so, um, you know, we are strategically kind of working on our um, our journey um, to to uh, kind of implement our zero trust architecture, building out our roadmap. We've we spent a lot mm-hmm. of time kind of looking at um, our, how, you know, we're, what our capability maturity is and kind of prioritizing building out that multiple year mode roadmap. We're also kind of, you know, working on the people part of that, transforming the culture and the organization to a kind of, you know, enable adopting a zero trust um, architecture and making sure that we are still providing good customer experience with for them. Um, the other thing is a multi-cloud. As I said, we're doing a lot of work in um, kind of uh, moving and building our, our solutions in the cloud, but really building that uh, multi-cloud architecture that we can, um, you know, strategically place our solutions um, and move move solutions um, when needed across our environments and really kind of optimize um, what that looks like to meet our kind of our business objectives. Laser focused on some very important areas. Rob, number one priority at Cloudera. So right now it is literally that first mile of data movement. I heard a couple of people here. Uh, Guardi, I'd love to help you with your challenges. Uh, we actually are helping uh, several organizations within the DOE uh, fabric, if you will. Um, but but that's our focus right now because we're we're sensing that all these transformation efforts start with this very first simple movement locate, find it, move it, enrich it, then, then you do, then you can take advantage of the decision agility that data brings to you, but you have to get it from where it is to where you want it. So that's our focus right now, Luke, moving data. Very good focus area and super important. Nick, number one priority for Verizon at this point. Yeah, I'm going to back it back down to uh, fundamental, fundamental basics, which is contracting. Uh, all, everything we're talking about is is amazing and it's great, uh, but if you can't contract for it, it's going to be very difficult to implement. Uh, and so our focus right now in federal at Verizon is EIS, Enterprise Infrastructure Solutions Contract. Uh, I want to highlight HHS uh, and their A on their recent Fatara scorecard. Department of Labor got an A as well. Uh, I know there's very a good. lot of focus on this uh, and we need to make sure we effectively transition off of networks and the local uh, WITS contract onto EIS so that we can take advantage of all of these new capabilities and services in an easy contract. And there's such a, uh, a, uh, a wide swath of capability inside of that contract. So we really do appreciate that and congratulate you for uh, being awarded that. Um, Scott, number one priority for BMC. Going to really be around our back end systems and making sure it's easy to do business with BMC. So the modernization of some of the order management processes and contract management processes, things like that. And uh, you know, we have a huge project going on in that area. But number two would always be security. So security is always top of mind, and it's a big deal for us, Luke, as you know. Tighten up the back ends and make sure they're secure. Well, we only have a few more moments left. And we always like to uh, to wrap up uh, just talking about the future. And then actually, Scott, we're going to start with you. And uh, we're going to ask you to sort of, you know, uh, look out two or three years. Uh, what's it going to look like two to three years from now? What are we going to be conversing on on this show talking about in regards to IT modernization? In my opinion, it's all about automation everywhere. And uh, the example I gave you of failing over Oracle uh, to DR in, in a matter of you know minutes uh, versus hours, 
I want to have that same capability with a one button push to, to fail over every business system in my infrastructure. That's, that, is, that is a number one priority as well. Have 100% software as a service, public cloud infrastructure. Um, you know, we have four data centers left and uh, quite frankly, I want them gone. Fully realized and fully automated. Nick, um, a lot of activity going on over at Verizon. I, let's assume that all of the EIS has been unlocked. 5G has been completely deployed. What are we going to see in three years from now? Yeah, I think what we saw a few years into uh, the deployment of LTE was the blossoming of Web 2.0. Uh, 5G is going to enable a similar transformation. And we're going to be all talking about you know, what 5G has unlocked. And I think what it means for the federal agencies uh, is going to be the rise of private networks, where you take a broad network and make it your own in each individual space, each individual office or, uh, or complex, uh, and really customize that network for that local, local need. Uh, so I think we're going to see the rise of 5G, uh, as well as uh, private networks throughout federal government. Looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, you've been in a lot of very key positions across the federal community, inside federal service, outside. What are you expecting to see over the course of three years um, as uh, sort of you're steering the helm there at Cloudera? Uh, I'd like to see the, I don't want to say democratization or, or commodity, AI, ML, access to data. Today, you have to have a data scientist. I'm seeing heads nod here. Guardy said, mm -hmm. Nicole said, you have to have this um, uh, hen's tooth of a person, right? You can't find them. And if you find them, you got to pay them a lot. But, but we have to broaden the ability to use data that isn't there today. Today, it's very difficult and complicated to make use of AI and ML for everyday use. So the commoditization of those technologies to enable agile decision-making at lower levels in the organization is where I'd like to see in the next two, three years, the industry go so that uh, the, the front end of the um, access, the tool that you would access an engine like ours is available to lots of folks so that they could run their query, do what they need to do to support not just the macro missions of agencies, but now the, the missions further down. Um, I think that helps transform the agencies faster and their ability to do their jobs. Certainly pushes information down there, pushes the ability to make decisions. It's almost like I'm hearing sort of um, citizen development in a cloud, sort of a data centric Cloudera kind of uh, environment, if you will. Right. And empowering that individual, which sounds awesome. Looking forward to that. Nicole, if I'm a freshly minted uh, special <laughs> agent and I got this case management system and these laptops and they give me a firearm and a badge and, you know, what, 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 what am I, uh, what's my experience going to be three years from now as I enter on duty at the IG? So I want you to have access to a strong kind of modern and secure application and service portfolio that's hosted in my in our multi-cloud ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And for that, I really want to see us um, strategically use AI automation and orchestration um, really to help be a workforce multiplier and empower our human staff to focus on the high impact and high value work. Right. Um, looking forward to that. It sounds awesome. I know you you all are well on your way to doing that. So I appreciate that. Melanie, I'm a freshly minted diplomat, right? I just got assigned to Morocco. You gave me this device for life, whatever that means, right? We know what it means. That's an awesome idea, by the way. Um, yeah. So what what are you what are you anticipating that experience will look like three years from now as you all are on this journey to really transform the State Department? Nicole made it very easy for me because I'm going to say everything that she just said. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see employees working from anywhere and everywhere. We are no longer going to be constrained by um, a locale, a location and things of that nature. Uh, we're going to be able to do it securely. And this is even going to uh, stretch out to some of our classified activities. Sure. We're no longer going to be constrained to, you know, brick and mortar and things of that nature of a, a federal facility or a lease facility, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, we want them to be able to come in and uh, we have to be able to provide that secure platform so that they can provide uh, the service back to 
the department, the mission in which they have been hired to um, achieve. And also, Nicole, you said it, that hybrid data center platform, multi-cloud, all of those things, uh, that's where we're going and that's our future in the near term. Uh, I, 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 I need to ask you there, are we talking about a high site environment in your, in your home uh, in three years? Um, I don't, I'm not saying that you don't put words in my mouth, Luke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as you said earlier, you know more I, than I, I, I know. I thought probably, I might right? hear something like yeah. that. <laughs> you know, but stranger things have happened. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know there's a, a lot of great technology out there that uh, is broaching that subject. So we'll see how that goes. Gardy, how about at Department of Energy three years from now, uh, as you all are on this tear to to really transform, uh, you, the, you've got this playbook out there. Perhaps you've run all those plays. Is there another set of playbooks or what are we doing in three years? <laughs> well, you, you never know. We, 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 try, we try to be uh, as helpful as we can uh, from the Department of Energy. But uh, one of the and, things- And we that, really do, again, appreciate that on behalf of the community. Awesome publication. Make sure you get out there and take a look at it. Yes, uh, please do it. And thank you for that. Look, um, it, it, we're very proud of the work. And it's, 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 you, when you read it, you'll see it's feedback from, from the larger community. It's mm-hmm. not just the DOE. Really, as I as I was sitting here, kind of thinking about or listening to everyone speaking, it, I feel like we sort of we're making a cake, right? It seems like we're we're sort of building on top of each other's uh, sort of uh, uh, comments and, and 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 thoughts, and which which tells me that we're we're having the right conversation. So, from my perspective, I think um, you know there's there's a, a phrase that I've I don't know if, I don't know if it's native to me, but I've been trying to push it is you know we need to be more um, innovative and predictive. You know, whereas, you know, a lot of time we've been proactive uh, and reactive. You know, we all know what reactive is, right? The problem, something happens, we try to figure out what happens. And proactive is, you know, hey, let's try, let's try to do this before, you know, let's move our, our software from this infrastructure to that infrastructure so that, you know, we, you know, we don't have an infrastructure failure. And whereas, you know, we're not thinking of, we're not looking at the technology as it's coming in and figure out how can it help us to sort of uh, fast, fast track to our, digital transformation. So uh, these are the things that I think we're going to try to do from, from our, from our department. And, and I, I, I think I, I, I expect to see a little, a little bit more from, from the rest of the federal space, but the two, two other things that I think uh, we'll see is that we'll see more sort of accessible and affordable uh, innovation uh, because of some of these things we talked about here, right? Um, there's a lot of tooling that's coming in to, to make data more accessible and to basically allowing us to, uh, deploy uh, capabilities more quickly, uh, you know, fell over more quickly, you know, mm-hmm. all of these things I think are v- extremely important. And then we talked about the customer experience. Um, I think I expect us to, to see a little bit more adaptable application tools and in ways that really uh, is supporting the, the the business and helping us to sort of deliver, you know, a really, really true uh, mission value outcome. So those are the things that I look forward to. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, technology wise, but I think um, if we sort of keep these things in mind, I think we'll do really, really well. And super important. Well, we're going to do a quick turbo round. Nicole, I'm going to start with you. Top lesson learned that you have sort of discovered, good or bad, if you will, or positive or, or not positive, uh, in regards to as you're on this modernization journey that you'd like to share with the community. I think the the biggest lesson learned area is just the, you know, as I think Melanie and just mentioned this, we are transforming people. Um, so just really kind of taking the time it takes to address the culture um, and provide the change management support to the people of our organization. We are introducing a lot of change, a lot of new applications to them at one time. So we really kind of worked on starting early and providing a lot of support um, as far as change management and some of the enterprise architecture st- um, support to help our our um, our partners along the journey um, with modernization applications. Sure, both uh, both the IT employees and the operators, right? I imagine exactly. both of them getting a, a lot of new changes. Melanie, top priority, excuse me, top lesson learned as you've gone on this transformation journey. Gardy said they were building a cake, so standing on the first layer with Nicole throughout there. Um, I'm just going to throw out there uh, continual communication, uh, building your platforms uh, where they you're not so piped into one vendor or one technology as far mm-hmm. as um, vendor agnostic. Let me just put it like that. Sure. Where um, we have the flexibility 
Rob talked about um, data and things of that nature. How do you how, how do you integrate this information that you may have on an old legacy system and you're trying to build modernize, but you still need data? How do you integrate to make sure that you're not losing or you're most efficient in at, uh, retrieving that data? So I just put it out there. I'm adding that layer to the cake. Gardy, take us home on your number one top lesson learned. So um, <clears throat> I will shamely, shamelessly do it. Uh, I'll fall back on the uh, scaling IT modernization playbook. <laughs> one of the things that one of the key takeaways from from the from the all the interviews we had with CISOs, CIOs, and chief data officers and whatnot was that technology was rarely the uh, the uh, the barrier uh, when it comes to to IT modernization, right? And I think. Uh, and uh, uh, Melanie, you kind of talk about this, right? You know, we oftentimes we we um, we sort of not we miss the soft tissue. I think someone kind of uh, put it like that: this soft tissue kind of uh, uh, problems, which are you know people, processes, policy, politics, and culture, right? Those are some of the things that we we learned. And uh, and uh, and lastly, uh, sort of you know uh, falling back to where we were. Uh, small incremental uh, progress is just as important as sort of, you know, a huge uh, behemoth kind of uh, deployment. So those are some of the things that we learned and, and we we hope to do, uh, well, we hope to apply some of these lessons learned as we continue to uh, uh, execute it toward our, our mission and vision for, for the department. Excellent words of wisdom for the community. Well, I'd like to thank each of our guests here for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us on this program. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for supporting us on the show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make this program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank the listening audience out there that tune in every month. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of the Federal News Network.